So as of late, I've been doing a bit of machining here in the workshop, mostly making caps and handles for a set of die holders. And apart from the drill, or at least what's left of it, and the form tool, these parts were exclusively machined using carbide cutting tools. Pretty much the same as the ones as I was able to use as weight in the dead blow hammer. These inserts are pretty much dead weight when they break, so it was nice to find a second use for them. If only I could find a second use for the other jars which I have left over. Still, every now and then I do get asked why I use carbide tooling over something like high speed steel, which on paper is much better suited and cheaper given the smaller lathe and mill which I run. And I think that's certainly a fair question, but I think sometimes something that's better on paper doesn't always translate to being better in practice. So let's start off with the basics. High speed steel and carbide. These are the two main materials which are used to make cutting tools. Well, metal cutting tools anyway. And despite being used for the same thing, and kind of looking the same, they do tend to behave quite differently as cutting tools. And in fairness, they're also aimed at different crowds. High speed steel is usually recommended for smaller manual machines, whilst carbide is really developed for larger CNC operators. In fact, of the CNC shops that I know, the only high speed steel tools that are used are high speed steel drills, and even those are being phased out in favour of solid and indexable carbide drills. Outside of those, every other cutting tool is either solid or insert carbide. And just for context, those are several ton CNC machines, which really is what carbide is meant for, not smaller machines like the ones that I have. But I am getting a bit ahead of myself. So let's start off with high speed steel, which I guarantee that you've used at some point, because even if you haven't used a lathe, you will have used a drill bit, and pretty much every drill bit, even the cheap ones, are going to be made up of some variant or grade of high speed steel. And all this stuff really is, is just high carbon steel with some alloying elements, mainly tungsten and molybdenum. And it's mainly added to give it a bit more wear resistance, which you'd want as a cutting tool, but it also helps prevent the steel from softening up when it gets hot. Which tends to happen a lot when you machine steel, and a soft drill bit, well, it won't be drilling all that much. And that's pretty much why the tools which I make from O1 tool steel can't be run at a high RPM. They're not made of high speed steel, they don't have the added molybdenum and tungsten, and as a result, they lose their temper when they get hot. The other advantage is high speed steel tools aren't all that expensive to make. Now obviously it will depend on exactly what you're trying to buy, but something as basic as a 30cm long bar of 12x12 12 12 high speed steel may cost you anywhere between 15 and 25 bucks. From there you can cut it into a few blanks, grind it into the shape that you need, and when it dulls, you simply resharpen it with a diamond stone. And these things should last you for years and years. Which of course does mean that you do need a grinder to grind them into shape, I mean you could buy them pre-ground, but eventually those will need to be re-ground. But thankfully grinding them isn't all that difficult, and even a super basic tool will cut fine enough. That's lathe tools anyway, end mills are a little bit of a different basket. The other good thing about high speed steel is that it's tough. I mean relatively anyway, it's still hardened steel, so it can snap eventually, but it can take a lot more bashing around without the edge simply snapping off and that makes them really good for interrupted cuts. It's also pretty important that it's not brittle when you need to make high speed steel razor sharp because you don't want the edge to simply snap off. And on that note, you should be able to get high speed steel sharper than you would get most carbide. And that can be really important when you're machining plastics. Less so with acrylic because you can polish it, but when you're machining something like acetal, having a razor sharp cutter can be important. Because generally speaking, the finish that you get with acetal is the finish that you're left with. You can't really polish it, so having a sharp cutter will give you the best surface finish. Now carbide on the other hand is a really different material to work with, because it's not actually a metal, it's more of a composite. These carbide tools are usually just carbide powders with a binder of some sort. They're then pressed into shape and then sintered in a furnace. And the shapes that they're pressed into are either blanks, which are laid aground, or pressed into inserts. Cutting inserts which are effectively ready to go. I mean, I hate to use the word, but they're just plug and play. I mean, all the cutting geometry is effectively pressed into the insert itself. 
And I think that's really one of the biggest advantages of carbide inserts because the operator doesn't have to worry about the ins and outs of grinding the tools. When the insert breaks or dulls, you simply swap it out to a new side or you put in a new insert. The whole process takes about a minute. Two if you manage to drop the screw. And even if you manage to do that, it's still going to be a lot faster than having to go and regrind the tool. Carbide also has the advantage of being able to run at far higher speeds than high speed steel. You know, it will depend on the tool and the material, but you can easily run it at two to three times the speed or greater. And obviously that means more material can be removed if your machine is powerful and rigid enough. To give you an example, I can run the lathe at about 550 RPM with this high speed steel cutter and get an okay cut. You know, this is a good speed for the high speed steel. It's cutting fast and I won't burn up the tool. But with the carbide, I can very easily double the speed to get the job done a lot faster. And on top of that, I do tend to get a much nicer finish as well. Carbide's also a lot harder than high speed steel. You know, I don't think I see the benefits of this when I machine something like mild steel or aluminium. But when you machine harder steels like high tensile or stainless, high speed steel's shorter machine life and hardness really do become apparent. This hardness though does come at the cost of the tool being brittle. I mean, one wrong move, or if you crash the tool, or if the workpiece flexes and the insert is pulled into the workpiece, I mean, the insert is going to be toast. Or if you're using an end mill, that could easily be 30 or $40 down the drain. So with all that in mind, let's talk about why I choose carbide. Specifically, carbide on the lathe. Now I think the most important thing I can say is just choose what cutting tool that works best for you. I know obviously it's a bit of a cliche, but cutting tools are always going to be a bit of a compromise and it's really up to you to see what works the best for you given the type of machining and what sort of machines that you have. But at least for me, I mainly use carbide and at least in my opinion, what I gain from having carbide certainly outweighs sort of the losses. And the big reason for me that I have it is mainly out of convenience and consistency. You know, I'm not saying that there's nothing to be gained from grinding your tools yourself and being able to resharpen them. In fact, I did that for a long time, but in my day-to-day -day operations down here in the workshop, I'd rather just be able to pop in a ready-to-use insert with all the cutting geometry pressed in and ready to go. And I think that's certainly an okay approach to have. I mean, you do you, but this is what works best for me. And on top of that, I think it's great that these inserts are consistent because that's something that you just don't get with hand ground tools. I'm not saying that these tools are going to be wildly inconsistent, but the surface finish that you get from one part might change as you regrind it. Carbide inserts, however, are just consistent, you know, because they're made in a factory using molds and held to a really tight tolerance, which means each cutting edge will be almost identical to the previous one and it'll be identical to the next one, which means the feet and speeds and the behavior of the cut should remain the same, and the finish that you get on parts is gonna be consistent. And when you do large batches of parts, having a consistent finish and a consistent cut quality is important. I mean, take these parts for example. These were made on different days using different cutting inserts, and if I didn't tell you, you wouldn't really know. Now obviously this is a big benefit with production parts, but I don't see why you wouldn't want that quality with just your everyday hobby machining. I also do like that the chip break geometry is just pressed into the part and when it works, it works well. I mean this generic one here is for mild steel and it works for that, but it also works well on a range of different steels and aluminium. And in my experience, the carbide ones just tend to work better than the ones I've ground into high-speed steel. I also like that it's a lot harder to burn up the cutting edge in carbide than it is high-speed steel, because doing that in high-speed steel usually results in the tool having to be reground entirely. I also think that it's worth pointing out, mostly because I think a few people don't think I do this, but even on this small lathe, I am able to hit the optimal speeds and feeds for carbide to work at its best. I generally run this thing at about 1200 RPM for 25 to 30 millimeter rod, and that's roughly what these inserts call for.
And thankfully the machine does have the horsepower to push the insert and remove the amount of material that it needs to remove. And just to add on to that, I mean generally speaking, carbide inserts aren't exactly that sharp. The edge is more rounded over, which gives you a longer lasting tool and a much tougher tool, but it does mean that you do need a fairly rigid and powerful machine to push the inserts into the work to remove that material. And that's why on the old lathe, I did tend to use these ground, you know, sharp inserts, which are mainly meant for machining aluminium. Now they certainly could be used for machining steel, which was fine and all, except the inserts didn't last all that long. And at least in that case, with me using those inserts, you could definitely make the case that I was certainly misusing carbide. But here on this lathe, I'm certainly getting the expected service life and the performance out of these inserts. With that said though, there are still downsides to using carbide inserts, and the big one is going to be the cost. I mean, you can't sharpen them once they break, which means replacing them is going to be an ongoing cost. And on top of that, there's also the price that you pay for the holders, which will only hold one insert in one orientation. And of course, there's probably about 20 different insert shapes. And for that reason why carbide can very quickly become expensive, especially if you're a manufacturer trying to optimize your setup. Thankfully though, I'm not, so I'm able to take a few shortcuts and save a bit of money in this area. The biggest thing that I do is just making sure that I have minimal number of inserts to work with, because whilst there are 20 or so, I only have about 6 that I use these days. I mean for a while, I was probably up to 12, and that got expensive really quickly. So for the most part, I've cut back and I use 6. Now one insert is specially used for threading, and I don't use that all that much. The same thing goes for parting, and I don't go through many of those inserts. Now I have some button inserts which are used for the fly cutter and I also have some milling inserts for the face mill. Which leaves me with two inserts which I usually use for turning. In my case that's the DCMT and the CCMT inserts. And for a basic small lathe setup like mine, these can easily do 99% of all turning operations that I need to do. The only real downside to these specific inserts is that they only have two cutting edges. You know, TCMT can give you 3, and the WNMG can give you 6, but these inserts work really well on my smaller machine. Now mainly I use the CCMT inserts for roughing and on difficult materials, and they also work really well in boring bars. And for pretty much everything else, I use DCMT inserts. You know, these inserts do most of the work that I ask of them, and they're able to get into small spaces. Plus, you can pick up these inserts for a reasonable price. You know, the price you pay will depend on the brand and the country of origin, but I pay between $1 and $5 per insert, depending on if I get it from China, or if I get a higher quality one from Taiwan or the US. The holders, on the other hand, are nothing special. I mean, you can pay a lot for holders, but these ones here are just the cheap holders that I received in one of those starter packs that you can buy off eBay. They're not the nicest holders, and the torque screws do tend to strip out quite often, so I do have a backup bag of torque screws, but apart from that, they do do the job just fine. Now, I have bought a few extra holders, but I've made sure that all of them fit these two inserts. But honestly, for 99% of what I do, I simply just use this one DCMT right hand tool. It's the one that you've seen in pretty much every single video for the past three years. You know, it's probably not the perfect tool every time, but for 99% of what I need, it's able to do it. And with this tool, I've been able to make so many things. Now that's not to say that I don't use high-speed steel lathe tools. I certainly do, but I only use them every now and then. But when I do need them, I'm very happy that I have high-speed steel on hand. Something like a form tool, for example. I mean, it is much easier and cheaper to simply make a form tool in about 5 or 10 minutes then it would be to go out and try and buy one. The same thing goes for custom threading tools which I've made in the past. I mean I do use inserts for 60 degree V threads, which is the main type of thread which I make, but in the past I've also had to make up 55 degree cutters for Whitworth threads, and I've also had to make other cutters such as module 0.8 gear cutters, which I mean I have no idea if you could buy it, and even if you could, I'm sure it would be quite expensive.
So much easier and cheaper to simply make it in about 10 minutes on the bench grinder. It's also worth adding that even with the small range of carbide that I have, it can get really expensive if I wanted it to, because each basic shape does have its variations. For one, each insert does come with various nose radii which you can change, but also you can get various coatings for the carbide, such as TIALN, which won't work with aluminium. There's also these sharp ground inserts which I mentioned before, those ones are best used for aluminium, and you can also get variations of chip breakers which are meant for doing specific materials. For instance, you can have a dedicated insert for doing stainless steel. Now once again, for production shops, these details do matter, and you can just talk to your tool rep about it, but for me, I don't worry a whole lot about this. You know, yes, sometimes the speeds and feeds do need to be changed around, and if I really can't get the chip to break, you know, I can just turn off the auto feed for a little bit, but that's not something that I usually run into, and for the most part, the generic chip breaker does a good enough job. And as a whole, this is pretty much the compromise that I've landed on over the past five years. It might not be the best setup, but it's certainly the setup that works the best for me. So with lathe tooling now covered, let me talk about milling, because with regards to the tooling, I am all over the place when it comes to using either high speed steel or carbide, and that's going to be for a few reasons. So as a broad generalisation, I think it's fair for me to say two things. The first thing is that milling machines are generally less rigid than lathes of roughly equal mass, because the extra moving axis we need to deal with means that it's going to be a lot less rigid, and as a result, there's a higher chance of the tool being damaged or just outright breaking. And end mills compared to lathe tools have far less mass making them up, owing to the fact that we need to remove material to make the flutes. And as a result, an equivalent sized milling tool is going to be a lot weaker and more prone to breaking. The second point is that milling cutters are a lot more expensive to buy than lathe tools, and they certainly don't last as long. And that's probably not much of a surprise, because even looking at a basic end mill, you'll quickly realise that it's actually a quite complicated piece to make. I mean, they're ground from a piece of either solid carbide or solid high speed steel, and just for one flute, I can see one, two, three, four, five, and six different grinds just to make this one flute. And this is a four flute cutter, so that's easily 24 different cuts to make this one cutter. Compare that to a lathe tool, which is done in three cuts, and I can do that freehand. And that's why even this cheap Taiwanese high speed steel cutter is easily 60 bucks. Now obviously, Chinese cutters will cost less, but even a 12mm cutter can easily set you back 15 bucks. Taiwanese is probably closer to 25 and if you want Australian or carbide, you'll probably be paying closer to 50 bucks. And on top of that, because the geometry that we're dealing with is so intricate, sharpening them is not that easy, or at least common. Yes, there are setups to do it, but you do need some sort of tool and cutter grinder to do it. I mean, some people will tell me that they can do it by hand, but I have yet to see that. Now obviously you can send these away to get sharpened, but you wouldn't do that for cutters this small. And that's why with end mills, I'm pretty careful not to run them too fast, or break them. And when it comes to breaking them, that is usually just game over. You know, normally you can lose a flute, or just outright snap it in half. Now if you do have a surface grinder, it is possible to re-grind the bottom cutting edges, but I don't, so that's never a possibility with me. So effectively, when I break end mills, that is usually the end of the road. And depending on what end mill that I'm using, that is easily $15, $20 or $30 down the drain. All this is to say that I'm pretty careful when it comes to choosing what cutters I buy and what cutters I use and when I use them. So generally as a rule of thumb, I tend to gravitate towards high speed steel tooling most of the time. The biggest reason is just because it's cheaper. And when I need multiple sizes and multiple styles and multiple numbers of the same cutter, it just tends to fit the budget a lot better. So for example, I do most of my milling in steel, which requires a four flute cutter, which gives you a better surface finish and is stronger. I generally use between eight and 12 millimeter cutters, which best suit my machine. So I tend to buy several of those at a time. At the same time though, I also tend to buy some two flute cutters for cutting aluminium and plastic. 
Those materials can be really gummy and they do need the extra spacing that you get by having two less cutters to help eject the chips. And on top of that, I'll also need some roughing end mills as well. So already there, that's easily 10 different end mills which I need to buy. That's probably about $200 if I'm buying that in high speed steel, but if I'm buying that in carbide, that could easily be three dollars or $400. And for what it's worth, I mean depending on the cut, high speed steel can be significantly better on a milling machine, because at the end of the day, it's still a small mill, and if I'm doing a rough cut with maybe a 12mm cutter, or if I'm doing wide cuts, you know, depending on the material, running the milling machine slow is going to be the best approach. Which is what high speed steel is really geared towards. And of course I'm going to be worried about breaking the tool. So generally when I'm trying to hog away large amounts of material, my approach is generally just slow the cutter down and let it do its job. I can easily run it at about 7 or 800 RPM and the cutter should last quite a long time. And that's generally my approach for most of the things that I do on the milling machine. But there are reasons why I do run solid carbide on the mill. And it's generally when I use the full tool length of the tool. Carbide's about twice as rigid as high speed steel, and as a result, there's going to be a lot less flex. Which is something that you can see when you're using the full tool length. I also can run it a lot faster than I can with high speed steel, and as a result, I can remove a lot more material. But unlike the lathe, which is rigid and able to hit the correct surface speed per minute, I do have to run the carter a little bit slower on the mill to prevent chatter. Don't get me wrong, it's still about 50% more than high speed steel, but I am running it a little bit slow compared to what the carbide really wants, and as a result, I do get reduced tool life. At least compared to what I should be getting. So effectively, I'm paying all that extra money, and I'm not getting the tool life that I should be getting. Which is why I really save the carbide for those situations where I can really get the most out of it. And as well as that, I do try to use the full length of the flute as well. I think it's just a more effective way of using this very expensive cutting tool. Because really with most end mills, I mean you're using the bottom bit of the tool all the time, but you're not always using the top bit. So as a result, the bottom wears out a lot faster than the top does. I do my best to avoid this, but it inevitably does happen. And if I'm going to get uneven wear, or wear out the bottom of a tool, I'd rather do that on a cheaper high speed steel tool and save the carbide tool for when I can really use the whole flute. And considering that they cost anywhere between $30 and $50 a pop, even for the smaller end mills, I'd rather only use them when I really need them. They also work really well for stainless and 4140. Especially work hard and steel, because the carbide is so hard that it's able to just chew through any steel that's been work hardened. Now thankfully, there is an economical alternative to solid carbide tooling, and that's going to be carbide insert tooling. Now on the whole, if you're using a smaller milling machine like I have, you probably won't be able to leverage the benefits of indexable insert end mills. I mean, to use these things, you really need to push them to make them work. Preferably, you'll also be climb milling with them as well, and as a result, they're mostly used on big CNC machines for roughing work. And then you'd come in with a normal end mill and clean it up. And for what it's worth, you'd probably want some sort of enclosure to protect you from all the chips that are coming off. Now the closest that I have is a 45 degree chamfer cutter with carbide inserts. And whilst it's okay for cutting small chamfers, given the price that I paid and the results that I get out of it, I probably wouldn't buy it again. But don't let that get you down, because face mills and fly cutters are definitely fair game, especially for hobby machines. You know, fly cutters especially, since they're just single point tools, so the cutting loads shouldn't be all that high. And with round carbide cutters, they are capable of producing really great surface finishes on parts. Now yes, high speed steel is probably better suited since it's less brittle and it can handle the interrupted cuts better, but button inserts are really quite strong and they hold up quite well. And in my opinion, they give you much better and much more consistent finishes than you would get with high speed steel. Now face mills on the other hand are going to be a bit more controversial, at least in the way that I'm using it, because I am really misusing the carbide here. But to me, what I'm doing is certainly worth it. So this is the one that I made here on the channel last year, and it has three cutting inserts, and they are razor sharp inserts. 
And this thing will tear through metal like butter. I mean, I can do two, two and a half millimeters depth of cut and a 70 or 80% step over and it will just tear through metal. It's doing it a lot faster than any end mill could do it and it is a lot cheaper because these inserts are only like two bucks a piece. Granted, it's only for roughing work, so obviously I will need to come in afterwards with a high speed steel end mill and finish up the part. But in terms of sheer metal removal, this is definitely the tool for the job. And at least to me, this is the perfect tool because I'm not burning up my good end mills, removing large chunks of metals. I'd rather let the cheap disposable inserts do that job. Now the controversial thing that I'm doing is I'm using the high rake inserts for this type of interrupted job. And the inserts really aren't suited for this job and they don't last very long. I mean they will chip quite easily. But still, even replacing them is far more economical than burning through end mills. Even if I'm theoretically not getting the most out of the inserts, I come out way better. It's easily one of my favourite tools and it's a tool that I think everyone should attempt to make or at least buy. Although I guess your results may vary. Do what works best for you with your machines and your budget. I've had this machine for over three years now and this is the setup that I've found works best for me. And that's about it for now. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you very much for watching. See you next week.